We are a people of the book. And by that I mean the Bible. If we do not understand the Bible properly, we cannot be faithful servants of God. Thus, we constantly emphasize the importance, as did the Bible itself, of the study of the Bible. To a young preacher a long time ago, Paul penned, Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Second Timothy 2.15. American Standard Version 1901 says, Give diligence. The idea of study is studious. That's the idea of giving diligence. Putting yourself into it, being studious. If you think about someone going to take a secular class in psychology, then they must be studious. To be a student is to be studious. It's to be pursuing the knowledge one desires. Thus Paul told Timothy that. Now it's interesting that Timothy's already a Christian and one able to preach the gospel, yet he still tells him that's what you need to do. So it's a continuing thing. Isn't it? it never stops. So study to show thyself approved. Well, one seeks approval. In this case, Paul tells Timothy, you're seeking the approval of God. Study to show thyself. Be studious. Give diligence to be approved of God. You may be approved of a lot of folks, but if God doesn't approve of you, it doesn't do much good when all is said and done and you face the end of this life and the dawning of a vast, unending eternity. We seek God's approval here. This is the time to prepare. That's what life in the flesh on earth is all about. And Peter tells us this in Second Peter 3, beginning verse 9, that time continues on to give man a chance to repent. That's the whole design and purpose of life is for man to find God, to learn that he has sinned for all his sin and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23, and the wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23. So men need to find God. And Jesus has declared himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me, John 14.6. That's why he said to the Jews, in his earthly ministry, except ye believe that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Die in what? Die in our sins. Sin separates us from God. Nothing else can. The color of your hair, your race, your ethnicity, your language, male or female, rich or poor, that doesn't necessarily separate you from God. Sin will. Sin's the only thing. It's, it's the problem that all men face. And no man alone or of men themselves can they solve it. Jesus did. Jesus came to solve the sin problem, and he did. Because he was tempted at every point like as we are, yet without sin. That's why he could go to the cross. Suffer, bleed, and die on that cross, offering his own body as sacrifice for sin and shedding his blood for the remission and forgiveness of our sin. Because he had no sin, he could die on behalf of others. All the punishment that came upon Jesus Christ, all the hurt that came upon him, all the shame that was built upon him, was nothing because he did wrong, not a thing because he did wrong. He never sinned. So he did all of that because he loves you and loves me. He loves all men. He made a way for man to be forgiven of sin and stand justified in God's sight as if he had never sinned. I'm interested in that way, and I'll never know it if I don't study to show myself approved unto God. Notice a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Ashamed before whom? Ashamed before God. Imagine the people on the great final day of judgment who will have been exposed or had opportunity to study the Bible right and left, some a lot more than others, but there it has been all along, the Word of God. 
but they're ashamed as they stand to give an account of their deeds done in the body, whether good or bad, because they didn't take advantage of this life and the studying of the scriptures. They didn't pay any attention to passages like Paul wrote to Timothy, study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, but then he had something to it. Rightly dividing or handling aright the word of truth. Notice it's the word of truth. What does that mean? You won't learn the truth about salvation if you don't know the word of truth because God's put his truth in his word. Thus you read in John 8, 31 and 32, as we quoted this morning, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Notice if you continue in my word. That's continuing to be students. Learning more about it. Rightly dividing. Handle it right. Well, if he tells me I must rightly divide it or handle it right, that means I can handle it wrong. And I don't want to handle it wrong. Because if I don't handle it correctly, and Paul by the Spirit said to Timothy, that's the way you approach it. That's the way you study it. There's a correct way to study it. Then you won't learn the truth of God's will left up to man in this life then to show forth the love he has for God and the things of God the word of God being one of them to study it to learn how to study Jesus said you search the scriptures because they testify me why else would I want to search the scriptures if it wasn't to learn the way of salvation I can't save myself sin's a transgression of the law 1 John 3 verse 4 all is sin the wages of sin is death. What will I do in that shape? I can't go to anybody else of, as far as human beings are concerned and have them help me in the sense of here's the way to salvation. Takes it coming from heaven. Where did any man get the will of heaven pertaining to salvation? From heaven. That's what Paul was meaning in Galatians 1 when he says, I didn't get it from anybody else being an apostle of Christ. That's how we got the Bible. But I received it by revelation of Jesus Christ. I want to listen to the men inspired of the Holy Spirit to write the Bible so I'll know the will of God that is recorded in the words of the Bible. Now that's the reason you've got that the seed of the kingdom is the word of God. Luke 8, 11. That seed is the same all times and all places. The seed principle is that everything produces after its kind. You plant corn seeds, you get corn. You plant watermelon, you get watermelon. You plant the seed of the kingdom, what are you going to get? You're going to get the kingdom. Again, showing the reason to study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing or handling right the word of truth. Because it's by continuing in that word, which would have to do with studying it, that we have ourselves enlightened. But we must rightly divide the word of truth. Now, that covers a multitude of things. But when you just take your Bible, <clears throat> as I've often done, people carry a Bible outline for a sermon right here when they hold a Bible. You'll see on there it says Holy Bible. I don't know whether one of them says it, but uh, most do says Holy Bible. So what? What does that mean? The Greek word biblos was just the word for book in the first century. When we put holy with it, it means it's dedicated to a given purpose. And since it's words dedicated to enlightening us on a certain matter, it's a holy book. Being that it's God's infallible, inerrant, all-sufficient, final revelation of God to man, it is the will of God and the word of God. It's holy. It's dedicated to that purpose. If I want to know the will of God, this cannot be a closed book to me. And if it's open, it must be rightly divided or handled aright. So I recognize it is not dedicated to teaching me chemistry. It's not dedicated to teaching me biology or anything like that. But it is dedicated, it's holy, it's set apart for teaching me the way to forgiveness of sins and righteous living so that I can hear fall from my lips or from the lips of my Lord to me concerning me on that day of judgment well done thou good and faithful servant before we go further from this holy book 
man must have faith in God and Christ if he's to be saved. Why is that faith formed? Remember, we are to study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Well, think. Paul said, so then faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the word of God. But the seed of the kingdom is the word of God. My faith in Christ is correct only when I've been taught correctly by the rightly divided word of truth. For it, containing the evidence that Christ is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, produces saving faith in me, confidence and trust in God and Christ. But without faith, it's impossible to please Him, for he that cometh through God must believe. Notice must. Can't get around it. It's imperative. Must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek me, Him. Now, the point is, we've already seen Jesus say to the Jews, except ye believe that I am he, you shall die in your sins. So you must believe in God the Father, you must believe in Jesus Christ, or you'll die in your sins. Well, what produces that, be, that belief? What correctly produces that kind of confidence and trust in God in Christ? Holy Bible, book divine, precious treasure to heart and mind, lamp to my feet and a light into my way, to guide me safely home. I wonder why a person wrote that. Because all scriptures give me inspiration of God. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished in every good work. That's where my faith comes from, is in the testimony of the scriptures. Christ said, You search the scriptures because they testify of me. I must believe in Christ, except you believe that I am he, shall die in your sins. But faith comes by hearing the word of God. So I can't believe in Christ if I don't know the word of God rightly divided. Can't do it. Impossibility. And thus, the dedicated book, the book of books, God's Word, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. But when I look at this particular book, I find out it's really made up of 66 books. And has two divisions, what's called Old Testament or Covenant and New Testament or Covenant. So if I'm going to write and divide it, I can't be wandering around in one part of it when the information I need is found in another part of it. And thus that drives me on because, you see, Jesus talked about people hungering and thirsting after righteousness. He said those are the only people going to be filled. If you want to learn the truth, and he that willeth to do his will, he shall know the teaching. Well, that's the person that hungers and thirsts after righteousness. That person and that person alone will be filled. So you can't haphazardly approach the Bible just uh, licking a promise to learn the truth. It must take all that you are and have given to the understanding of the truth. So I see these two major divisions. Thirty-nine of them are called the Old Testament. 39 of them were called the Old Testament. Old what? And why old? Testament. A testament is an agreement or a contract. And so there was an old one. Well, it's uh, interesting to note that, those 39 books, because actually you have two different periods of history that God has dealt with in there. Most of it had to do with God dealing with the Jews under the law of Moses because most of the Old Testament pertains to the law and the prophets. But the first part of it doesn't. It covers what is known as the patriarchal age, a period of 2,500 years in which God dealt with man through the head of the families, the father, patriarch. And it's sometimes called the father rule period. It covers as far as uh, being the law whereby men approach God from Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, down to the giving of the law to the children of Israel in Exodus 19 and 20. People of that time were Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, those we call the patriarchs. The rule that guided them from God was fundamentally moral law, and they worship offering sacrifices on altars wherever they erected them. 
discuss very briefly in Hebrews 1, 1, and 2. God, who at sundry times and divers manners spake at time, passed unto the fathers by the prophets. And in these last days, now we're back to Jesus. And in these last days, spoken to us by his Son. And we have made heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. Yes, God at one time spoke different ways, different times, dreams, etc. But when you get past the Old Testament, He has spoken to us by His Son. Wasn't that where we ended a little earlier? With Jesus. And that's why it's faith in Jesus. A scriptural faith. A faith that leads us to obey Him. Jesus said, why call you me, Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? And that echoes the sentiments of the writer of Hebrews when he said in Hebrews 5 and verse 9 that he's the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. So we come back to the Old Testament and we see then in that patriarchal period that it covers basically the book of Genesis, as I say, down to Exodus 19 and 20 when God gave the law of Moses through Moses on Mount Sinai to the children of Israel after they'd left Egypt. That was a period of 2,500 years. Now there's no use trying to go to Genesis and ask the question that you won't answer today, what must I do to be saved by Jesus Christ from my sins? You won't find it, not directly. And you can go into Joshua in that uh, law period. And you can ask that same question. And you'll not learn what Jesus wants you to do to be saved. You'll not learn what Jesus wants you to be saved and how he saves you from any part of the Old Testament. And that brings us then to the law of Moses, a period of 1,500 years whereby the Jews... The descendants of Abraham through Jacob approach God under that law. It begins in Exodus 19 and 20. It goes down to the time of the cross when Colossians 2, 14 says plainly that it was nailed to the cross. And thus, the way that the Jew approached God is not the way we approach God. The Jew didn't even approach God under the law like Abraham approached God. God doesn't change. Had a good lesson on that, but His will has changed. God and Christ and the Holy Spirit being deity, they're the same today and forever, but the unfolding of the scheme of redemption has made changes in the law. In fact, the writer of Hebrews says in order for Christ to be a high priest, there must have also been the necessity to change the law. So from man's perspective, looking up to God, who we inhabit time, God doesn't. So as these things come to us, then that means changes in things. The Jew didn't worship God like Abraham did. And once the Lord came, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, lived a sinless life, came to sacrifice for sin, died on the cross, buried, raised the third day, and ascended back to heaven. Then on that first Pentecost following the resurrection of Christ, he started his church. He didn't start churches. He started his church. Well, he should because he promised to build only one church, Matthew 16, 18. Upon this rock, the truth that he's the son of God, I will build my church. And he did. And all those who believe the gospel of Christ and obey it are added to that church by the Lord himself, Acts 2, 38, 41, 42, 47. So the people who are Christian don't approach God under patriarchy or the law of Moses. They approach God under the authority of Christ. The New Testament. Now we've got a New Testament. That's why you can call it other one old. Because we have the Testament of Christ, the New Testament. And it's in that New Testament that we learn the way of salvation. And we learn the way to live the Christian life. And we learn how it is when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me, John 14, 6, that what that way is and how to enter that way and what that truth is and what it means to me and how we gain life through obedience to that truth. But notice in your Bible you have these three great ages. The first, the patriarchal age, a period of 2,500 years. 
the unfolding of how God would save man from his sins, the law of Moses, a period of 1,500 years. Then the New Testament. 27 books make up the New Testament. And we learn then what one is to do by reading those given now, we could go further and break down the Bible as far as rightly dividing it from that concept of rightly dividing it. You can go into the matter of it being the law books, books of the law, the Pentateuch, fivefold volume, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. God inspired Moses to write that. Then you go into the matter of the time of the judges and the time of Joshua preceding that. We won't spend time to go through all of those. Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, 2nd Kings, 1st, 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. We would call that the historical section because it covers history. It's not just history. It's telling us about God unfolding the scheme of redemption in those early times with man and the great worthies of the faith. One thing that you'll learn is that the faith that saves man has always been an active, obedient faith, whether it was under patriarchy or Jew under the law of Moses or whether it's a person of the day under the law of Christ. It's always a living, active faith. It's never a dead faith or faith only. It's always a living, active faith. And I'll choose simply one example from the patriarchal age, and that is the example of, of Noah. You can find that record over in Genesis chapter 6. At least we could begin there. And it'll pretty well set the pattern for the rest of the way uh, through the rest of the New Testament and Old Testament concerning when faith saves somebody. Now the Lord's going to destroy the world because it's a wicked place. But verse 8 says that uh, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. I'm told a lot of times, well, if, you, if you're saved by grace, then you, there can't be any kind of law. Because see, if there's any kind of law, you've got to obey that law, and that means you're trying to earn your own salvation. Well, he found grace in God's sight. God favored him. And look what God did when he favored him. He gave him directions. And he tells them then about building the ark. He gives him the dimensions of the ark, what the ark's to be made out of, and so on. And what's interesting is that when you come to verse 22 at the end of chapter 6, the scripture says, this is the man who found grace in God's sight. Thus did Noah according to all that God commanded him, so did he. Now, if you're saved by grace and not saved by doing something, how come they're both mentioned here in the same way? The fact of the matter is, the only way no listen, the only way Noah could show his faith to God was through taking God at his word and keeping God's commandments. Noah didn't know to do all these things about the ark, except that God told him. Verse 14, make thee an ark of gopher wood. Now imagine Noah standing and saying, well, I know what gopher wood is. I know what an ark is. And I know you've said it's my responsibility to make the ark. But I think you can save me because you're God without me building any kind of ark. Besides that, if I said about to build an ark, he'd try to show you I'm trying to save myself. You don't find that. Because that means it's a kind of work that's not meritorious works simply works in response to God's command. Thus, he's the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Here's an example of it. Way back before there ever was a law of Moses for the Jews to use in approaching God or ever was a gospel of Christ, and yet it's the same way. God favors Noah. God gives Noah a plan. Noah keeps the plan in faithful obedience. And lo and behold, the Holy Spirit had this to say 
concerning this very thing in the New Testament in that great chapter on faithful service to God. Listen to what that Holy Spirit had the writer of Hebrews say. Hebrews 11 and verse 7. By faith, Noah being warned of God, we'll stop right there, by faith. But faith can't come except the word of God preceded it and the person who had the faith received the word of God. So when it says by faith Noah, it means Noah had a revelation from God. What do we read about in Genesis 6? God favored him and then gave him in words a plan that when he would submit to that plan and do his part, he would be saved. And what's the record? Verse 22 of Genesis 6, Thus did Noah according to all God commanded him. So did he. What is the inspired writer of Hebrews saying as an example for you and for me? By faith Noah being warned of God, not seen as yet, moved, uh, of things not seen as yet, moved with fear. Watch, prepared. Is that doing something or not? Prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heirs of the righteousness which is by faith. Now that's written in the New Testament of Christ. What does that tell me about using the Old Testament, since we're not under it, as it benefits us under the authority of Christ in the New Testament? It tells me faith saved back then, just like faith saves now. And the source of faith is the same now as it was back then. Faith comes by hearing the Word of God. And I must receive with meekness the engrafted Word. It's able to save my soul. That's what happened, and you have it recorded in the New Testament by the same Holy Spirit that recorded it through Moses in the Old Testament. And thus he stands as an example for our response to the teachings of the seed of the kingdom, which is the Word of God, Luke 8, 11, today. So we are not expected, as we study to show ourselves approved unto God, to go over here in the patriarchal age and find out how Christ saves me. I can't go over here in the period or the part of the Bible known as the uh, law section and find out how Christ is going to save me. But I can come down to the words of the last will and testament of Jesus Christ and I can find out the will of Christ right there. And it was Jesus who before he left this earth said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Well, the gospel is God's power to save us from sin. It's the glad tidings of Christ, Romans 1.16. Then notice, the people who hear the gospel, they're told that if you believe and are baptized, you'll be saved. You'll never find that taught to Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob, or Moses, or anybody under the law of Moses. But it's certainly taught to those under the authority of Christ, he who is the way, the truth, and the life and that no man cometh unto the Father but by him, John 14, 6. The very one who said, If you love me, ye will keep my commandments. John 14, verse 15. So if I open my Bible up, where am I going to go to to find out the will of my Savior? Am I going to find it in Genesis alone? I'm not saying it's not the Bible. I'm just simply saying the way of salvation for us today in the Christian age is not found in the book of Genesis or Exodus, or Leviticus, or Numbers, or Deuteronomy, or First, Second Samuel. It's not found there. Now, it is true you can begin reading there, and it will take you all the way to Jesus Christ, for it was meant to do that. And you begin reading in the law section anywhere there. And if you read and study it rightly, it'll take you to Jesus Christ. Well, that's exactly what it was meant to do. The law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. But when that faith has come, we're no longer under a schoolmaster. For we're all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free male nor female, for you're all one in Christ. And if you be Christ, you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. The old preachers used to say, that's not nearly it, that's it. And that tells us of the unfolding of the Old Testament, and it all comes down to be revealed in Jesus Christ. As it is said in John 1 and verse 14, 
the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld His glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. You can begin at any scripture as it's rightly used, and you can come to Jesus. Remember Isaiah 53, the Ethiopian eunuch, reading it, not understanding it? He said, of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or some other man? Philip began at the same scripture and preached him Jesus. Because that's who the prophet's talking about some 750 years before Jesus walked this earth. Isaiah 53. Everything points to Christ. And you can see the same thing concerning the church. Before Acts chapter 2 on that first Pentecost feast day of the Jews following the resurrection of Jesus Christ in Jerusalem, everything that's said about the church spoke of it in future tense. After Acts chapter 2, you find that it's uh, spoken of in past tense as to its beginning. It was on that day, some people even called Acts 2 the hub of the Bible because everything centers around it. Someone said one time in the Old Testament at the beginning of things when man sinned in the garden, God set forth for Pentecost. That's exactly right. Everything you read of in the Old Testament was preparing for Pentecost. Remember, God didn't come to know anything. It was already in the mind of God. But men living governed in time and space and material things, time had to pass. But God knew where he was going. Just like when Christ was born in the fullness of time. There's an exact time Christ came into this world, not before or since. In the fullness of time, God sent forth his Son. So when you begin to study your Bible, there has to be an approach. And I've only touched, or maybe even just reached forward, trying to touch the hem of the garment. When it comes to unloading on what is meant in 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But I can tell you this, if you keep that in mind and milk that verse for all it's worth, you'll understand how it is you'll continue to grow all your life in proper understanding of the Scriptures, beginning with these very fundamental matters today of a Holy Bible, of an Old Testament and a New Testament, of the meaning of the word testament, why one's old and why one's new, of the three great ages in which God has dealt with man on this earth, the patriarchal age, the mosaical age, and now the Christian age. And then when this age ends, all time, space, and material things come to the end. God will bring everything to judgment, with every secret thing that people have. And men will give an account unto Christ at the judgment bar of God as to how they lived on this earth. Thus, we want to be living our lives while we have a chance to change. And God's giving us and blessing us this chance to change, to be sure that we are living as the New Testament teaches, that we're studying our Bibles, that we're meditating on His Word, that we're hiding His Word in our hearts, as David said, that we might not sin against God. So it's a never-ending thing. But set your mind on this goal to study. Never keep, cease study. Be correctable. Always go ahead. Don't become impatient. Just keep studying. And you will be filled. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. Ask and it shall be given to you. The key is never, never, never give up. That's what the Lord wants to see in your life and my life is a constant effort to know and to bring every thought into subjection to Jesus Christ. That's being faithful. Well, we'll close this brief lesson on the survey of the scriptures, if you want to call it that, or maybe rightly dividing the word of truth, or what to say of the scriptures. If you're not a child of God, then we taught the very plan of salvation Jesus has recorded in his Bible as to how to become a Christian, even at what point God remits your sins. To believe in Christ based on the scriptures, repent of your sins, confess your faith in Christ, and be buried with your Lord in baptism to obtain the remission of sins. If you've done that, and as a child of God you've sinned, you need to review your life honestly, repent of your sins, confess them, and pray God for forgiveness. 
And we always have an invitation at the end of our sermon so that we can encourage people if they need to obey the gospel or correct things in their life to respond to the gospel invitation. So we ask you to do that if you need while we stand and sing. <laughs>